Chapter Twelve of the King's Daughter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Daughter by Pansy. Chapter Twelve. The Temperance Dialogue. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Dell had been very busy for two weeks. Mr. Nelson's last brilliant idea had occupied all her leisure time. It was complete now in all its details. The girls were perfect in their parts, and the eventful evening had arrived. They were to have another temperance meeting, the distinguished feature of which was to be an original colloquy, subject, the pledge, performed by members of the society. It had not been announced who the author was, and only Dell and Mr. Nelson knew. To show you in what degree the new idea succeeded, I will give you the performance entire. First in order was the reading of the pledge by Mr. Nelson, and the pledge was worded thus. I hereby solemnly promise to abstain from the use or sale of all spiritous or malt liquors, wine or cider, as a beverage. Then Tommy Truman had a word to say. Is there a father or mother who loves his or her children who would not be glad to have the names of those children on this pledge? Is there a sister, a child, a wife, a Sunday school teacher, who would not rejoice over the added names of their dear ones? Can there be any good reason for refusing to sign the pledge? Can there be two sides to this question? Are we not all agreed? His sturdy little friend and fellow signer, Harry Mason, made the somewhat pompous answer. There are undoubtedly two sides to this question. Many persons differ, and may we not say differ honestly from the views that have been expressed? At any rate, they would like to be heard before being condemned. Are there not thousands of people, good people too, who never touch the accursed thing and yet sign no pledge? Tommy Truman responded, Is that an argument, my friend? I can't see how your thousands would be worse off if they proclaimed their temperance principles by signing the pledge, and thus helped others to know where they stood. Harry answered with indignant eyes and puffy cheeks, But can't you trust a man when he promises you, without putting that promise on paper? Why, yes, said Tommy, of course you can. Don't you ever take a man's note when he owes you money, nor ask for a receipt when you pay him a thousand dollars? You must trust him, you know, without his name on a paper. How would your argument work, if you call it an argument, on any question but temperance? Tom Stewart was on hand next. Our friend forgets, too, that we don't ask his name on the pledge because we do not trust him without it, but to help him to trust himself. Every honest man knows that his determination to do or not to do a thing grows stronger and firmer every time he commits himself in words or on paper. Every true man honors his promise, and, if he means it, he is not ashamed to confirm his own resolution by putting his name to it. Then Harry contemptuously. Let the weak one sign it, then. We who are strong and have principle need no pledge. It was Mr. Nelson's kind, grave voice that made answer. We, then, that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. There was a merry Truman, who now took up the question. But suppose we sign the pledge and break it, would it not be a great sin? Is it not better to drink wine a hundred times than to break one promise? Think of the multitudes who have done this. Besides being drunkards, they are covenant-breakers. So if I sign the pledge and break it, what then? Tommy's answer burst forth. I say shame on you, and again I say, sign to keep and not to break. No drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, my Bible says. Do you suppose it will be a comfort for a lost soul, when he lifts his eyes, being in torment, to remember that he never signed the pledge? If you are afraid you will break the pledge, then you are in danger already, and who more than you needs the restraining power of a sacred pledge? Afraid you may break it and go back? Why, you are back now. You are the very one who needs help, and if you have any regard for your word, the pledge will help you. Will Jones was the next speaker. I have no desire to make a display of my temperance principles. How many people sign the pledge because they would have people think them very good and self-denying? I have seen enough of this empty pretense, this temperance hypocrisy, whereby people drink on the sly and yet get a name for abstinence. Let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Susie Carter answered him, That's the queerest argument I have ever heard yet, and I have heard some queer ones. I don't write any letters to my friends, for that would be making a parade of my affections. There are people in this world who cheat, therefore I won't profess not to. People sign the pledge and drink on the sly. That was the refined expression that was used, I believe. 
therefore i won't sign it less i may drink on the sly too is that it then the idea of quoting from the bible to match that style of argument it must be the only verse that gentleman knows he cannot at least have come across the one that declares by their fruits you shall know them or neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house or this let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven there was a nice oldish lady deeply interested in the temperance cause who had been coaxed into service and who now popped up and spoke earnestly for my part i don't see no great difference between drinking brandy and wine and cider and eating it and so long as you folks like mince pies and nice sauce and things as well as you do you hadn't ought to come down on them that makes them for you her own grandson a splendid young fellow answered her i agree with you in that matter it is as well to drink as to eat brandy but grandma can't you make mince pies without brandy and is there no other delicious sauce but this are we indeed as badly off about our food as was miss flora mcflimsey about her finery she had forty dresses yet nothing to wear our heavenly father has filled the world full of good things and yet without mince pies mixed with brandy we are in danger of starvation miss lily archer asked the next question may i ask abstainers if any such pledge as the one given here this evening can be found in our bible the very last chapter warns against adding anything to this sacred book will not those abstainers be cursed for being wise above what is written before i sign this pledge i must have a thus saith the lord tommy truman was ready with an answer but they said we will drink no wine for jonadab the son of rechab our father commanded us saying ye shall drink no wine neither ye nor your sons for ever thus have we obeyed the voice of jonadab the son of rechab our father in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days we our wives our sons nor our daughters that's bible doesn't it sound somewhat like a pledge perhaps you would like also to hear something about the nazarites temperance pledge and daniel's and jeremiah's and paul's the bible is verily good enough temperance pledge for me then fred edson had a word to say but did not noah drink freely and wasn't he a good man did not the priests and kings of judah did not jesus they called him a wine-bibber and were not the disciples in the habit of drinking all they wished peter in his great pentecostal sermon does not deny that his friends were very fond of wine he merely says they were not drunk so early in the morning at the communion table did not the saviour command them to drink the wine drink ye all of it then remember what paul tells young timothy take a little wine for thy stomach's sake what can you say to that tommy truman was ready for him i can say are you timothy have you timothy's complaint has paul examined your physical disorder and directed wine and have you some of timothy's wine noah drank freely you say yes and got drunk therefore we must solomon had many wives must we david committed murder peter took the name of god in vain you say christ commanded them to drink wine and you might have added that he changed water into wine therefore it is wicked to pledge against wine we must drink but what if that wine which jesus made at the marriage in cana and that made at the communion and that recommended by Paul to Timothy, was all new, the fresh juice of the grape. Then where is your Bible for touching the filthy, poisoning stuff sold in bar-rooms and saloons, a compound of prussic acid, cocculus indicus, alum, brazil wood, gypsum, lead, copperus, sulphuric acid, logwood, muriatic acid, lavender, cloves, and rosemary? Then young Williams, oh do stop this talk about poison doesn't the bible say every creature of god is good and nothing to be refused isn't wine a good creature of god has the creator taken so much pains to make all these things and shall we call them nasty poisons let us beware how we pour contempt upon the word of god and on his good creatures this brought edward phillips to his feet with a glowing face every creature of god is good good to eat and drink you mean rattlesnakes are creatures so are crows would you like a dish of them to eat how about poison ivy quicksilver and nitric acid god takes pains to make all these creatures therefore if we do not drink them let us beware how we pour contempt upon the bible is that the argument fred edson meantime seemed to have thought of a new idea 
but are we not called unto liberty while this pledge of yours makes one a slave? It binds one hand and foot, puts a lock on one's mouth when he is ready to die with thirst? Did not our forefathers bleed and die to eat and drink what they would? Have you never seen the Declaration of Independence and its list of glorious signers? You have surely heard how when Washington put his name there, he said, Give me liberty or give me death. Shall I sign away my liberty? Never. Edward Phillips had not yet exhausted his fund of sarcasm. Liberty, he repeated in scornful tones, liberty to drink rum, liberty to reel through the streets, liberty to fight and swear and roll in the gutter, to have a black eye and a bloated face, to have rags, poverty, and contempt, liberty to bruise one's wife and beggar one's children, to end up in the prison or on the gallows. Is this the liberty that our fathers bled and died for? Is this what our blessed Bible means when it says we are called unto liberty? Why, the pledge is the breaking of the prisoner's chains. It is the sign of liberty to be a sober, industrious Christian man. Charlie Brown was the next speaker. But this pledge makes cruel distinctions in society. You may be prepared to put yourself in a straitjacket. You may have no taste for intoxicating liquors. Water may satisfy you. Many others are not prepared for this sacrifice. Is it kind, is it polite, to ask others to join a pledge that would be so hard for them to keep? Think how awkward such are made to feel when your pledge is presented to them and they cannot sign it. Is it like a true wife to put down her name and so place a bar between herself and her husband? Does not this interfere with the happiness of the husband and wife? Humph, said Tommy Truman. That is, it would make my neighbor feel uncomfortable if I should paint my house, therefore I must let it remain as rusty as his. If a lady's husband swears, so must she. If he chews tobacco, so must she. If he would sooner go to a horse race than a prayer meeting, must she go too? It might interfere with their mutual happiness if she should pledge herself to Christ. What must she do? Harry Mason interrupted him. But cider is good. It is splendid when sucked through a straw. It is nice when friends come to spend an evening with you. It is very refreshing when you are tired or cold or thirsty or hot, or when you have lost your appetite. Cider keeps me from the pledge, wine others, beer others. I do love cider. I make no concealments, let us be frank, but I never expect to drink to excess, nor to drink hard cider. Cider is good, you say, said Tom Stewart. How much does that remark mean? If you are talking about nutriment, there is more nutriment in one pound of beefsteak than in a whole barrel of cider. Apple juice ferments in twenty-four hours after being pressed from the fruit, yet you are not going to drink hard cider. Hard cider contains more alcohol than lager beer, porter, or ale. At a meeting where there were sixty reformed drunkards, the question was asked, how many of you believe that you could not drink one glass of the mildest liquor without going back to your former habits? Every one of the sixty arose to their feet. They evidently considered cider a dangerous drink. A few years since, a young man in Massachusetts learned to like cider by sucking it through a straw, at fourteen his daily beverage was cider, and he would become beastly drunk. At eighteen the father offered him a farm if he would sign the pledge. His answer was, I'd rather have my cider. At twenty-three he was in a drunkard's grave. Yet my friend here says, cider is good. By this time Mary Truman had found voice again. But what, pray, will come of the great army of brewers and distillers, saloon-keepers, bartenders, and others, if we all sign the pledge and don't patronize them any more? going to let them starve? Her brother answered her briefly and sharply, Let them go to work like honest men. Lily Archer curled her pretty nose as she said, So many of your pledgers are such outrageous fanatics. Better to be a fanatic than a drunkard, said Tom Stewart shortly. There was a bright-eyed little girl sitting near Mr. Nelson. He suddenly turned toward her and said pleasantly, Laura, I have a request to make of you. A request, she repeated with wondering eyes. Yes, do you know I want you to sign this pledge? I? Why, what possible good could that do? I am not in danger. Everyone is in danger, my child. Men and boys, you mean, Mr. Nelson. I mean women as well as men, girls as well as boys. You, young as you are, are not too young or too wise or too strong to escape. He goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Besides, you have influence. Laura, if you sign, you may save someone. If you refuse, you may ruin someone. 
if I really thought I had any influence, or could be the means of helping any one, I would sign it. I think I will do it, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Nelson said, with a bright smile. More than this audience are rejoicing over your decision. Truman, will you pass the pledge book this way? The young girl's cheeks flushed a deeper red, and she said in some confusion, Do you really mean I am to sign it now? Now, why not? Do with thy might what the hand findeth to do. But before all the people, isn't there time enough, Mr. Nelson? Let your light so shine before men, quoted Mr. Nelson meaningly, and without more ado, Laura wrote her name. Now, Laura, I wish I could get you and all young ladies to make one more promise, that you would never marry a man who refuses to sign the pledge. This was evidently putting the matter a little too strongly for Tom Stewart. But, Mr. Nelson, he said, what if a man entirely worthy of Miss Laura in every other respect, and truly loving her, refuses to sign the pledge? Should she have nothing to do with him? I do not believe, Tom, that a man who will not shut and lock and bolt and bar the door between himself and strong drink ever does truly love, honor, and respect a woman. That is taking strong ground, you think, but I have lived more years and watched this matter longer than you have. I tell you, it is dangerous." Laura had been listening, her large eyes fixed intently on the speaker, and suddenly she said, I promise, I do promise. Mr. Nelson answered quickly, Thank God, may you be helped to keep your vows. End of chapter 12 Recording by Tricia G.